Story recapped here. Today, I'm going to show a 1997 action, adventure, and sci-fi film called, The Fifth Element. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. It's 1914 and Professor Packley and his student, Billy Masterson, are investigating the ruins of an Egyptian temple. Packley is on the verge of discovering an ancient prophecy and interprets the writings on the walls. It speaks of a great evil that will come in 5,000 years, unleashing from a black hole and causing chaos and death. The only thing that can stop it is a weapon consisting of the four elements, water, fire, earth, and air, and the fifth element, a perfect being. Packley believes that the fifth element is the key, but he is unable to figure it out. Just then, a priest from the secret order approaches the two men, offering a toast of poison water to their success. Packley throws out the water and insists that they drink wine instead. Just then, an enormous ship lands on top of the pyramid. The priest is terrified and gasps that they're here. Huge robotic-like creatures emerge from the ship and approach the men. The priest pleads with them, telling them that Packley was about to discover everything but he arrived just in time. The alien race, known as the Mondoshawans, reveals that the priest was their human contact from Earth and tells him that they must take the stones and the fifth element because war is coming and it's no longer safe on Earth. The leader takes out the key and opens the walls. The absurdity of the events causes Packley to faint, while the priest can only look on as the Mondoshawans take the four stones and the sarcophagus containing the fifth element. Billy regains his composure and fires at the aliens, thinking they have killed Packley. The priest tries to stop him, but it's too late. As the wall closes on the Mondoshawans leader, the alien gives the priest the key in his last mission. As the ship flies away, the priest promises them to pass the knowledge until their return. 300 years pass, and it's the year 2263 on Earth, the year of the prophecy. The great evil appears as a giant fireball traveling towards the blue planet. A military spaceship in direct line with the president observes the threat. Just as they're about to shoot the fireball, a priest named Vito Cornelius from the secret order intervenes. He insists that there's no use shooting the threat and the only thing that can save humanity is within a great prophecy of the four and fifth elements. The president dismisses his theory and proceeds to shoot anyway. The fireball absorbs the missiles and hurls them back at the ship, destroying it instantly. Back on Earth, Corbin Dallas is a divorced, ex-soldier now working as a taxi driver and living in a cramped apartment with his cat. His close friend, Finger, calls him and they plan to meet up tonight. Corbin gets about his usual day, apprehending a mugger, and taking his taxi out for his first drive of the day. Back at the president's headquarters, Cornelius explains his theory in detail and convinces the president to grant the Mondoshawans, who are carrying the elements, into their territory. On their way to Earth, the Mondoshawans are attacked by a group of rogue aliens called Mangalores and take the box containing the elements. The Mangalores contact their human conspirator, Jean-Baptiste Emmanuel Zorg, who is working for the Great Evil and they agree to meet at his factory. The government visits the crash site and manages to retrieve a surviving hand from the Mondoshawans, taking it to their research lab. In a recovery chamber, scientists reconstruct the hand's DNA back to life. After a quick reconstruction process, the chamber reveals a naked woman lying on the table. The woman wakes up and is shocked to find herself trapped inside the glass chamber. She cries out in an ancient language. One of the generals approaches her and taps on the glass, taunting her. The woman breaks her hand through the glass and knocks out the general and takes his multipass card. The alert bells start ringing and she finds herself trapped in the room. Seeking the only way out, she breaks through the walls and escapes through the ventilation system. She soon finds herself at the top of the building and jumps to escape the police. She lands right on Corbin's flying cab. Corbin checks on his impromptu passenger and feels instantly attracted and intrigued by her. Sensing her vulnerability, he decides to protect her from the pursuing police officers. They race through the streets with three police cars chasing them. Corbin takes a sharp turn and leads them through a rundown part of the city, losing one car to a delivery truck. They get back on the main street and a horde of police cars fire at them. Corbin takes them down to the innermost streets and through the fog, disappearing from the police's radar. The woman tells him to take her to a priest named Vito Cornelius and he manages to track him down to his apartment. Cornelius sees the elemental marks on her arm and faints when he realizes that she's the fifth element. Not wanting to waste time, he gets his assistant, David, and they prepare to meet the fifth element. Meanwhile, Corbin glances at the sleeping woman and kisses her, only to be met by her gun. He apologizes, calms her down, and learns that her name is Lilu. Cornelius and David arrive to give her the key to the tomb and usher Corbin outside. He goes back to his apartment and calls Finger, apologizing that he didn't stick to their meetup and telling him about Lilu. 
Meanwhile, Lilu learns 5,000 years worth of history through Cornelius's computer and tells him that the stones have been stolen but she knows exactly where they are. At the same moment, Zorg meets up with the Mangalores and their leader, Aknot. Zorg trades the stones for new weapons, but when Aknot hands over the box, it's empty. Cornelius then learns that the Mondashawans gave the stones to someone they could trust and Lilu was supposed to contact this person. They track the person down to a hotel called Floston Paradise in Planet Floston. Suddenly, there's a knock on the door and a group of men appear and take Cornelius to Zorg. He threatens the priest to tell him where the stones are but he doesn't give in. As he explains his plan to Cornelius, he chokes on a piece of cherry and Cornelius saves him. Zorg spares his life and lets him go and orders his henchmen to track down the stones. His men intercept a meeting with the president and learn that the Mondoshawans gave the stones to a diva named Plavalaguna who will be performing at a charity ball at the Floston Paradise. The president agrees and asks the military to hire their best agent which happens to be Corbin Dallas. The soldiers manage to track down Corbin to his apartment. He finds out that the military rigged a raffle contest to let him win two tickets to Floston Paradise so that he could go undercover and retrieve the stones discreetly. Just then, Lilu appears outside his door and Corbin manages to convince the soldiers to hide in his fridge by lying that Lilu is his girlfriend whom he's planning to marry but hates the military. He lets Lilu in and Cornelius threatens him with a gun and asks for the tickets. Just then, the police swarm the building looking for Corbin. He hides Lilu and the priest in his apartment and the police arrest the wrong guy. The Mangalores arrive and intercept the arrest, snatching the body bag and not knowing that they took the wrong guy too. Once the coast is clear, Corbin takes Lilu and Cornelius out of hiding. The priest knocks him out momentarily and steals the tickets. When Corbin regains consciousness, he accepts the mission. Lilu and Cornelius arrive at the airport with David who acquired fake passports. Just as they're about to check in, Corbin arrives and takes David's place. David runs to Cornelius and tells him what happened. The priest instructs him with the key to prepare the temple while he goes after the other two. The Mangalores arrive, disguised as Corbin and Lilu, but they are caught up with security quickly. Corbin is then whisked away by a flight attendant to meet the flamboyant radio talk show host, Ruby Rod. Cornelius sneaks into the restricted area and manages to get into the plane. Meanwhile, Zorg is called by Mr. Shadow, the dark entity existing within the Great Evil. Mr. Shadow threatens Zorg to retrieve the stones or else. In Planet Floston, the rocket plane arrives at the hotel. Corbin wakes up and finds Lilu missing. Lilu has managed to track down Plava Laguna. The diva senses Lilu hiding in the hallway and sends out one of her assistants. The assistant tells Lilu to meet Plava Laguna after the concert. On the other hand, Corbin is dragged away by Ruby, giving him a tour of the hotel and then of the opera house, as he goes on and on in his live radio show. The concert starts as Zorg arrives. The curtains reveal Plava Laguna to be a blue-skinned alien humanoid opera singer. As she sings her piece, the Mangalores invade the diva's room and take the box. Lilu intervenes and takes out the Mangalore group on her own with martial arts skills she absorbed while learning through Cornelius's computer. She knocks out the remaining brute just as the diva finishes her song. Lilu retakes the box and is stopped at the door by Zorg and his gun. He demands the stones back and Lilu tosses him the box and jumps into a nearby air vent. Zorg sends out rounds of fire at the vent. Meanwhile, the Mangalores have taken over the entire hotel and are holding some guests hostage. One of them shoots Plava Laguna and she collapses in Corbin's arms who then hides her under the chairs. Now with the stones in his hands, Zorg plants a bomb in the room and leaves immediately. Back at the opera house, Ruby is left alone with Corbin and the diva. With her dying breath, Plava Laguna tells Corbin to help Lilu save humanity and reveals that the elemental stones are actually stored inside of her. This comes as an extreme disappointment to Zorg when he realizes that the box is empty and he goes back to Floston Paradise. Corbin takes a Mangalore down and instructs a frantic Ruby to hold a gun to the alien's head. He then opens the diva's wounds and retrieves the four stones. He wraps them in his jacket and hands them to Ruby, asking him to guard it with his life. As the Mangalores surround the area, Corbin takes the gun and kills several members of the crew. The aliens fire back with missiles and drive him to hide behind a bar. Ruby crawls and escapes to one of the balconies. The Mangalores have Corbin trapped now as they make him emerge from the rubble with hands up. Corbin spots Ruby up at the balcony and signals him to move to the side. One of the aliens orders him to get down and he jumps on a plank of wood, sending the alien's head through Ruby's balcony. Ruby holds him down and the alien panics, firing his gun at his crew. Corbin gets a hold of a gun and fires it at the remaining aliens. As more of them start spilling into the room, Corbin takes Ruby and launches a grenade at them. With guns firing at them, 
They hide under a table and survive the explosion. They make their way to the control room where the remaining Mangalores are holding Cornelius and several other humans hostage. As they take down some of the alien crew, Corbin identifies their leader and plans to kill him, stating that no Mangalore will fight if their leader is killed. Just then, the leader asks the humans to send in someone to negotiate. Corbin volunteers and swiftly kills the leader with one shot. With the hotel back under the humans' control, Corbin manages to track down an unconscious Lilu at the diva's room. Cornelius and Ruby follow him and discover the bomb. The alarms go off and the guests are immediately evacuated. The group makes their way to the docks just as Zorg arrives back at the hotel room. They find Zorg's ship and board it. Back at the hotel room, Zorg deactivates the bomb. Unbeknownst to him, the last Mangalore alive activates their own bomb as revenge and it detonates, killing Zorg instantly. Corbin, Lilu, Cornelius, and Ruby safely escape through the stolen ship. On their way to Egypt, Lilu gains consciousness and talks to Corbin about the strangeness of humans. The two share an intimate moment and Corbin can't help but feel more attracted to her. Meanwhile, the fireball has picked up its pace and is racing towards Earth with dangerous speed. The president calls Corbin and gives him the ultimatum. They have about two hours before humanity is wiped away. Back at the ship, Lilu learns about the violent history of wars between humans. She is disgusted, disappointed, and shocked to learn that she's saving a race that's causing so much violence. The group lands in the desert and is met by David who takes them to the temple center. Corbin carries Lilu and places her on the center table. With little time left, the group tries to figure out a way to activate the weapon. They match the stones to their respective places but have no idea how to open them. Corbin tries to wake Lilu up and asks her how to open the stones, but she can only give out a cryptic message in her day's state. Wind blows. Fire burns. Rain falls. There are only three minutes left to annihilation and David stands in front of his stone feeling desperate. He lets out a sigh and suddenly his stone moves. The group gathers around and Corbin figures out that they need to imitate the elements. He blows on the box and a glowing golden stone emerges. David runs to the earth box and dumps sand into it, revealing the earth stone. Cornelius then wipes his forehead and opens the water stone with his sweat. As they gather around the last box, Corbin takes out the last piece in his matchbox. He lights the box up and reveals the fire stone. He goes back to Lilu and wakes her up. He begs Lilu to save them. But she says that there's no use in saving this world with nothing to live for. Corbin breaks down and tells her that there are things worth saving for like love. He needs Lilu to save them because he needs her. In the last moments, Corbin declares his love and kisses her. Just as the fireball is about to hit Earth, four beams of light erupt from the stone and hit Lilu, activating the ultimate weapon. A blinding ray of light emerges from Lilu's body, stopping the fireball in its tracks. Corbin holds on to her body as he feels the enormous force around them, the lights go out after a few seconds and it's confirmed. The fireball has been destroyed and humanity has been saved. Corbin takes an exhausted Lilu in his arms and they are greeted back at Earth as heroes. The president tries to visit them, but the scientists insist that they aren't ready. Inside the recovery chamber, Corbin and Lilu engage in a passionate embrace and make love. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.